Hey guys, my name is Simon Hewitt. Um, I'm down at uh, Infinity Motorcycles in Camberley uh, to pay them a visit and to go through my kind of Dakar 22 finishing Yamaha 450. So we've got quite the treat here today. It's absolutely fantastic. I mean, she's a beast. It, she's proper a beast. beast. <laughs> I mean, the first thing I noticed when you wheeled it off the van was the fuel tanks, because it looks like it's yes. more fuel tank than anything else. So the thinking with rally bikes is you have to cover so much distance. That's really important to, to carry the, the fuel needed to cover the distance. So you have to do at least 250 kilometers um, through any terrain. So that could be deep sand, that could be tarmac, that could be anything. So, so this bike it has 31 litres of fuel spread over four tanks. Okay. Um, the rear tank has its own pump and then the front three tanks have their own pump which is at the bottom of the left hand side. Okay, and yeah. And you can switch between the two up here and a little switch just on the dash here, front and rear. Don't put it in the middle, that means off. <laughs> okay. And you'll find out very quickly that that's happened. So. Perfect. Nice. So yeah, a lot what, of fuel. What are the other buttons you've got on here? What do they do? So quite simple on this one, on and off. That's the headlights, nice. And then lights here as well. You've got a little horn. <laughs> nice. <laughs> it's <just> hilarious. <laughs> uh, and then the fan is manually controlled, on and off. Okay, oh, that's a nice breeze. And then you can uh, monitor the water temperature then on your little dash down here as well. So, um, so it's a manual thing. So whenever it got to like maybe ninety degrees, something like that, I'll uh, check the fan and give it some air. Nice. Okay. So there's no automatic kick in. You've always got to keep no, an eye on what the machine's thing. doing. Okay. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's cool. And then how much of this is left of the standard bike because it's it's pretty heavily modified. Yeah, it's not much. It's not much. So believe it or not, this actually starts life as a standard WR450F. Okay. Um, but then it goes to uh, these guys down here, Dragon. Um, they're a French company based in Calais, quite okay. uh, fortunately for us, because they're quite <laughs> close to us. And, so, um, so yeah, and they take a stock WR450 and they basically take it to completely to bits and uh, they start by modifying the chassis. Um, there are lots of kind of like different add-ons, kind of um, mounting points for the tanks, etc. Okay. Um, just stiffening it, stiffening it up a little bit as well. Uh, elongating the swing arm, which is just down here, increases the uh, wheelbase of the bike, adds some stability at high speeds through the desert. Okay. Um, the exhaust is re-rooted, re re um, bigger radiators, um, obviously the whole kind of nav tower is um, welded on to the chassis just underneath the, the headstock just here. Wow. The suspension's all different um, to deal with the extra weight of the tanks and to deal with the extra kind of speed of desert racing. Um, and yeah, there's a whole bunch <laughs> of uh, modifications, but basically it takes them about two weeks to, to get a bike ready from your kind of stock trim to Dakar ready. Wow. And you say about the the suspension, the swing arm is sort of being adjusted for stability and speed. Exactly. What sort of speeds are you hitting on the, on the sand? Uh, so that's a question... Depends who you're asking that. That's all right. Do you have a speedo? Actually, that's probably you a good do, question. You do yeah, have a speedo, okay. Yeah, yeah, you have a, a, a kind of a manual speedo here, and then the organization GPS unit sits here, which um, tells you your kind of like speed by satellite. Okay. Um, so the top guys are hitting 175 to 180 kilometers an hour. Okay. Which is over 100 mile an hour um, off road. <laughs> um, for me, I. I I'm, I'm an amateur racer. I'm not that level, so okay. I didn't really like to go above kind of 120, 130, something like that. that. What's that? 70 plus? 70, miles 80 now? Mile now. That's yeah. still fast enough. It's That's fast pretty enough. terrifying. Yeah, it's fast <laughs> enough. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And um, and yeah, you know, for me, kind of growing up riding in wheels, racing in the woods, kind of that open desert, it's not um, a natural terrain for me. Okay. So. Yeah. That 
definitely factors in as well and like the, the consequences of crashing at those kind of speeds uh, it's just unreal that's a big off isn't it yeah big, for sure there's no small small crashes in the desert no. unfortunately no. okay in wales the terrain is much different what would you do to prep for riding on the sand and the deserts and the dunes and things like that yeah um to, to be honest growing up growing up in Wales and doing those kinds of races, the terrain that we have there and in the UK in general, but especially in Wales, it's really technical and difficult terrain to ride. Okay. So um, it actually sits you in pretty good stead for kind of any kind of riding really. Um, gotcha. We kind of see it a lot that kind of British enduro races do quite well internationally um, okay. for that reason really, because yeah. they can adapt to other terrains because what we've grown up with is very technical and difficult. Okay, yeah, you so, can take those skills and apply it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it. But, okay. but for sure, like riding the dunes is its own kind of discipline. And I did some training in Dubai. Um, I raced in Morocco. Um, just kind of like getting my head in the game in terms of uh, desert racing. Cool. But um, but yeah, it's um, yeah, it's very different. But a lot of the uh, skills that you learn on the technical terrain in the UK, and especially the bike fitness that you get from riding that kind of terrain. It's a it's a proper workout, and more so than <laughs> desert racing is on its own. Yeah. Okay. So by gaining that bike fitness and that kind of terrain, you can then take it to Dakar mm -hmm. and other desert races. So. Cool. And it's not just physical strength in terms of handling a bike around. It's also um, endurance. That's it is. what I mean. So I mean, yeah, like, how absolutely. long? What, what, how long would you be on a bike for for a typical day? I mean, I know the stage lengths vary, but yeah. What? How long would yeah. you be on the bike, say, for? I would be on the bike roughly averaging about 12 hours a day. Wow. Yeah. So that <laughs> won't be all off road. That'll be generally a uh, typical day. You probably do like two hours in the morning on tarmac to get to the start of the, the, the off road okay. bit. What's yeah. They call the special. Um, and then we'd start that. And then my typical stage times were like between six and six and eight hours wow. off road. Um, usually with a, a 20 minute um, refuel break about halfway ish yeah and then generally you'd have to do another couple of hours at the end on tarmac wow. to get to the <laughs> next bivouac so okay long that days. sounds pretty brutal long days. okay <laughs> yeah so 12 hour days for 13 days Jeez. Yeah. and when do you feel like you've actually recovered <laughs> Uh, never. <laughs> By the time the next one rolls around. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah, exactly that. It's, um, yeah, for sure, like, for the next kind of month, I'd say, I was just kind of, like, just tired. Yeah. All the time, just wow. tired. But at the same time, you've got that kind of, like, that feeling of achievement and accomplishment. And um, so that kind of outweighs any kind of fatigue you feel. Um, That's nice. So, yeah, yeah. it's good. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. And what's this seat like for for riding? Because it looks a little bit chunky, but it still looks like most bikes yeah. off road are a bit of a plank. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, exactly that. So it's it's a bit softer than a stock seat, and it's a bit taller as well. Um, okay. I'm a, I'm a bit taller, so I'm like six one. So um, I went for a slightly taller seat because um, if you're sitting on the bike and you go from like sitting to standing all the time, okay, the the shorter distance that is, the less it works. Your just the little out. things that sort of add like up to make it more comfortable. Small margins everywhere, yeah. you know, and small margins over 8,000 kilometers, you know, they soon add up, yeah. you know, so. Okay. Um, and the seat's good, it's... Um, What's it covered, what is it? Uh, it it's of? like a... Alcantara type thing? Yeah, suede kind of thing, it's pretty soft underneath as well, so, um, I mean, it's comfortable for the first hour. <laughs> and then for like the rest of the day it's not but um but yeah i think it's as good as i'm gonna get it so um yeah i think i'll stick nice. with this one for future riding so. good stuff and what what would you find in in this little pack here what i'm guessing is this all that you can carry in terms of stuff yeah. when you're doing the stages or so uh, there's another little hidey hole on the bike which is in the front bash plate just behind the front wheel here oh okay see just oh, that's here cool. i had some tools in there and then I had some tools in the back here as well. Um, so in here I had my tools. I had a, a first aid kit in here as well. So, um, so yeah, just a simple kind of tool kit. Uh, slightly customized for the for the bike, but fairly basic. There's some things that are missing from here as well. Mm -hmm. that I've took out still a bit of desert sand on it as well. A lot of desert <laughs> sand. Yeah, still. Yeah, exactly. But, um, but yeah, so the tail pack from Krieger, that was awesome. 
Mm. It's absolutely perfect, super easy to fit and didn't budge for the whole race. Perfect. Um, I only had to go in there once um, and that was to get some tools out for someone else that had broken down. Nice. So, um, so yeah, I got my uh, you know, good karma up good. in that instance. Good. So, yeah. That's all right. Super and is this good. for changing tyres on the go, is it? or? So that's just in case, yeah. So these little um, uh, tyre levers here, one this side, one this side little ring spawner on the end here. Mm -hmm. So that's for the front, uh, front axle. This is for the rear one. And then, um, and then you've got, obviously got two levers there as well. So um, super, super useful, just in case, just like that peace of mind, really. We run looses inside the tires. So it's okay. like a form insert. Yeah. So you can't get punctures, um, but the looses can fail. Um, so yeah, it's just in case. Okay, and is that, um would you still run inner tubes with that or? No, so no. It, it replaces the inner tube. Okay. So if you imagine uh, a blown up inner tube, but made of foam, essentially. Gotcha, okay. You put that in the tire and the tire onto the wheel. Difficult to fit <laughs> and to get off, but once they're on, you're, they're you're, bulletproof. You're you pretty good to go. Puncture. It's like, it's just impossible. You can hit things as hard as you want, you won't get a puncture. That's cool, nice. Something else I spotted was this little Casio wristwatch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so this one, um, yeah, a little uh, eight pound off Amazon job there. Um, these watches, I don't know why, but like enduro racing in the UK, like everyone just has one of those on their on their um, handlebars because oh, okay. with enduro racing you have to have like good timekeeping, so you have to be at certain checks at certain times, um, and. Uh, it's just a little just the go-to habit for me <laughs> but yeah i needed a watch for my um for my bar so yeah eight pound on amazon can't Perfect. go wrong <laughs> and what does how does this work i mean this is like yeah. a very crude satellite navigation thing i'm guessing yeah yeah so this um the whole kind of navigation thing with dakar it's its own animal really um so there's a, a few elements to it but generally it is quite simple so in the left hand column you have the distance that you've covered in kilometers. In the middle column you have a diagram of the junction or the terrain in front of you. Okay. And then uh, in the right hand column you will have some extra instructions. Um, so like for this one, uh, yeah, that's its own thing. Basically it means parallel to tracks, but okay. yeah, yeah. The, the whole kind of language with the Road book navigation side of things is uh, uh, it's a bit tricky and it just takes some learning. So, okay. but um, and that's you you wind that by hand as so you go. It, so it's it's on a little switch down here. Okay. Down switch here. Yep. The uh, the kind of rubbers and this a little bit perished, so it's not kind of rolling on as oh, nicely okay. as it uh, as it should. But that couldn't goes backwards. If you want. <laughs> but yeah, it doesn't go forwards very nicely. Um, and then this one up here will be a trip meter. And then this one would be uh, your compass bearing. Um, so the, the numbers in yellow are your compass bearing that you want to go to. Um, so for example here, you turn right to an average compass bearing of 80 degrees. Uh, sorry, okay. left to 80 degrees. Um, and uh, QTPP, um, so it's all in French. It's an abbreviation <laughs> of French words. So, quitter uh, piste principale, quit the main track, essentially. Okay. Um, so yeah, it's uh, it's its own kind of kind of world, really. The, the rally navigation stuff. I imagine that probably takes quite a bit of learning to to get used yeah, to. Yeah, you get that. used to it. You get used yeah. to it. Yeah, yeah, for sure. You, cool. But definitely, you don't want your first time doing that stuff to be a Dakar. No. <laughs> you want to do a few before that, but yeah. There's a Kickstarter here. There's a Kickstarter. Does it have an electric start as well, or is it kick so it every it's, time? It's all. Um, so it's got an electric start. Mm -hmm. There's some really cool kind of like redundancy features built into the bike. Uh, one is the Kickstarter. So if your um, if your battery dies or something like that, you can kickstart it and it does work. So you got that there. Um, another little cool thing. Um, obviously, there's a lot of electrics on this bike. Yep. Very complicated. And if you had a fault in those electrics that was kind of killing the battery, then you can basically. Um, bypass the whole thing because the bike has two wiring looms that you okay. can switch between That's so cool. if you had a, uh, an electrical fault you could switch from the rally kind of wiring loom to the 
uh, a motocross wiring loom which will basically just run the engine and make sure you can get home basically gotcha okay and you can do that just under here there's a little switch so you unplug this one yep and plug in this one here okay and then that disables everything up here um, so you won't get the automatic wind on or anything like that your GPS unit and your uh, nav units should still work for a bit because there's um, capacitance in those yeah um, but uh, but you'd lose some of the functionality up here okay. but you'll be able to get to the the next bivouac and then your team can sort it that night so just to get you home basically just to get you just home, get home. yeah That's it's just a nice little thing so um so yeah nice little feature there if you need it <laughs> yeah <laughs> hopefully you don't but yeah there was nice. one instance i actually didn't need that and it was um at the port in Jeddah when i was collecting my bike because when oh, you okay. ship the bikes out there they disconnect the batteries yeah so I went to the port, went to start it, couldn't start it because the battery was disconnected. So I had to switch to the motocross wire oh, okay. and kickstart it <laughs> yeah. in 35 degree heat. And then Lovely. <laughs> right, through, right through the middle of Jeddah in 35 degree nice. heat at rush hour. So um, it was 50 kilometers to get to the, like, the bivouac from the port. So yeah. yeah, that was the sketchiest bit of the whole two weeks, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> and I guess when it's that hot, the hot air that well, the hot air that's out there is just replacing the hot air yeah. on you. It's no, there's no cooling effect. No, it's just no, heat, it's heat, more heat. Yeah, for sure. Not nice. Yeah. And this might sound a bit silly, but there's obviously a lot of sand. There is where you're yeah, racing. Absolutely. How does this not just get clogged full of sand and stop running? How does it not suffocate from the sand? What um, what's changed on it? Or the, the good thing about the sand is it's super dry. Okay. So it kind of just falls off. So so the bike will get to the end of the stage, and it'll look dusty. Um, a little bit but to be honest it won't be nearly as dirty as if I was racing in the UK for example okay um, so for sure we change an air filter every single day um, okay and I carried a spare one with me as well just in case because um, that would get full of dust and yeah uh, you, know, you want to prevent the breathing of the yeah the bike. exactly yeah so so that's really important to, to, to keep on top of that kind of th side of things make sure the bike's breathing right and um, so yeah but generally the sand it you know it can be physical to ride through it can be um, but the more kind of the more you do it the more you get used to it and then the less energy you expend doing it so okay that's yeah the better you get so um, so yeah the sand is all right and it's um, it's it's hard in the engines to to get through because it's so soft because mm. the air, engines revving quite high up all the time but in terms of getting in the bike and rearing it it's it's only you know if you think of like western beach race when it's like wet sand okay yeah wet sand turns into a grinding paste and then that ruins causes the bike. havoc with everything. but dry okay. sand is okay yeah nice okay uh, in terms of bike maintenance mm. every day we were changing the oil and the oil filter okay and the air filter yeah um, and then after that um chain the sprockets on the rest day so six days in okay yep um and we also i think i did a uh, we changed the fork seals because they went after one day particularly okay. kind of um fine dust in this area that we rode through and that kind of blew the fork seal so gotcha um, okay so we changed those um had a massive crash on stage four and bent the bent the handlebars so we had to change those um but other than that that was pretty much it of oh, tires tires yeah. tires and mooses generally every other day oh okay oh yeah. well it goes from quite quickly then actually yeah yeah, yeah. and what about uh, brakes i mean uh, do you use them that much on the on the courses not, or not too much i think i think i run the same uh discs and pads for the whole race yeah yeah nice. yeah cool not not too much you have to break hard no i can imagine <laughs> <laughs> I imagine it doesn't end well either if you were to break hard on sand. Yeah, I mean, yeah, if you have to, it'll be rear brake. But, um, but yeah, yeah.